Welcome back, Red Spotter. Another show you in the Red Spotlight Entertainment Podcast. I'm your host today, Alexis J. Soto, joined by Mr. Kyle Lira. Today we have a news-themed, jam-packed show for you on this episode number 272. Let me tell you what we're talking about. Jamie Foxx is back as Electro in Spider-Man. That's insane. What else is also insane? The Lion King is getting a sequel with the director of Best Picture winning Moonlight, Barry Jenkins. Mm -hmm. We're also discussing Cineworld shutting down Regal Cinemas, Disney firing 28,000 people, a Nick Fury Disney Plus show, the casting of Miss Marvel, and then a cascading effect of movies being pushed again from No Time to Die to Dune and Batman. And we also have some hard numbers, emphasis on hard, uh, for Bill and Ted Face the Music on Premium VOD. That's our Whoa. show today. Before we start, I do want to remind everyone that our show airs or drops, depending on your terminology, every single Sunday and sometimes on Thursdays. And the return of To the Table uh, with our Ghost Tober theme is back. We just recorded an episode on Poltergeist. What is it, is, Kyle? Is that what he's calling it? He's Ghost- calling it Ghost Tober. He's calling it Ghost Tober because... Okay. Yeah. He's right. the one that came up with the theme. We did our first episode with Poltergeist, uh, and we also will be doing The Sixth Sense this month. So that is also on our feed, and it is scheduled to drop on Wednesdays. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Right. Ghost Tober. Ghost Tober. And we also do want to remind our audience that there's a lot of wonderful horror themed content of course this month we've already recorded and dropped the episode of the haunting of hill house we also will be reviewing the haunting of Bly manor which is you know the sequel on netflix as well as audio commentaries for the stanley kubrick stephen king classic the shining and then as well as mike flanagan's dr sleep so all of that is there for you and also we we do want to you know give you guys content in terms of like where we're doing and this is also an occasion worth, you know, reminding audiences that we just recently did episode 270, which was our fifth anniversary celebration of episode 13, Diamonds Are Forever. I just recently listened to that discussion, uh, I think a few days or so, and I thought it was really well, really well placed discussion. And we also have a fun game about Disney quotes. So, yeah, because we got to celebrate the cult in some some shape or form. Uh now, when you say episode 13, you mean episode one, because it is the official episode of well, the first... Well, uh, Kyle, there, there seems to be a long-standing disagreement <laughs> in terms of like what we officially acknowledge as the first episode of the series. Prior, it was like a 12-episode, I guess, test run before... I def- wasn't the person who named, who titled those episodes one, two... 12 okay so i'm just going by your book of terminology that's what you called those episodes and that is what they were treated as at the time of recording well it's like how some people dismiss rise of skywalker as being (laughs) um an official star wars episode i you know that 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 is up to my discretion you are the creator of this podcast and it is your right to acknowledge whatever you'd like to i am the ceo of the red spotlight entertainment network um and i will have my say (laughs) if that is what you'd like so without wasting any more time kyle Uh, how are you doing (laughs) well i just I was asleep an hour ago. So, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, at work, let's just say the sports season has not been kind. <laughs> it's almost as if like, and it, I mean, I, I feel like I say this every time I talk to you and yet every single time or the following instance, it seemingly topped itself because I always say to you, it feels as if. As the year progresses, and as we go deeper and deeper into the coronavirus pandemic, your job is getting more, the workload anyway, is becoming more and more swamped. And yet, here we are again, and with the sports officially back, you are (laughs) seemingly in a worse spot. Especially because football. Football, like, this community is big on football. Let's just say that. 
Um, I think this country is big on football. Oh, but um, another thing, um, uh, Alexis Moreno. She placed an order. Ah, and I saw her. She's pretty good. She's she's, she's doing yeah, good. yeah. I nice think she was in town for a birthday or something. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that was really nice. Um, but yeah, um, she gave me some news. I don't know if she's told you or not. Um, but uh, I don't want to share it here on the um on the podcast in case anything gets jinxed. I have a feeling I know what it is. She hasn't said anything, but I'm sure she will in the next recording. But I have a good idea what it is. She said recently she did some kind of professional setting conversation take place something like that yeah um, yeah but so, yeah uh, so well, if that's the case congratulations alexis um but I, yeah i i i assume it's good news we're not we're not saying what it is in case right. um things get jinxed you know because oh, yeah. we here in uh especially in october we're very superstitious here it's not just October. I think Kyle and I are just naturally superstitious in nature, especially in, in, in anything involving the podcast or our personal lives, because we have been through numerous instances mm-hmm. in which we have said we were so confident of something happening that it wasn't close to happening yet. And then when it came close, it fell apart completely. So like in case you're wondering, Kyle are very used to things falling apart and crumbling. So, yeah, you know, let it crumble <laughs> oh my and God. we'll stand tall. Well, that's, um, uh, that's the thing- part of it's in theme. The um uh, the thing is is that like I'm not superstitious, but well, I am a little bit stitious. You don't want oh okay. <laughs> All right, well that's <laughs> that's wonderful, Kyle. That's great. Let's um why don't we just go ahead and jump into the, this week, right? We got some weird news. In fact, I think uh we've done five ish years of shows where we talked about the film industry and news in particular with like casting and the announcement of new projects and films. I don't know considering what's on the table of contents or the menu, if you prefer for today's program, I don't know if we've ever done a show where the main stories were such, were, were just so crazy that this, like two things here that the, the top two th- stories are um, just things that no one expected. <laughs> and yet here we are. Yeah. Uh, do you remember yeah. a show that we did that was like filled with such crazy stuff? I don't. Okay. Here's the thing. Like the, we are truly in a weird timeline <laughs> going on right now. I don't know if our paths converged. I don't know if like, um, if we went through uh, the Scott Lang's uh, van or anything like that, because we are in some sort of weird um, ether multiverse, if you will, and you know, keeping up with the theme of what the what the news announcement is. But I don't think like anything like, and this is where like it's piquing my interest with um, what's going on at MCU. Mm. Um, just to just to clarify, um, as uh, you mentioned on the top of the show. Um, Jamie Foxx was casted as Electro. Yeah, at, at, in the MCU Spider-Man Three, Tom Holland's Spider-Man Three. Now, for you, those who may be wondering, but wait a minute, that's from Andrew Garfield's. Yes, you are, and you know, completely right. You know that he is from, and also J.K. Simmons. Who spoilers if you haven't seen Far From Home? Um, J.K. Simmons appeared as J. Jonah Jameson at the end of Far From Home, and like this is giving me a glimmer of hope because I wasn't necessarily like I have to see the overall execution of everything, mm. but. Like so far, it's getting weird and it's getting wonky, and I'm all for it. Um, because here's the thing: even though I did not like the Amazing Spider-Man two at all, um, this opens the door for so many different things to come to light and everything like that with the multiverse and everything like that. Um, we'll see 
who beats who to the punch with um with DC and um and Marvel because Flashpoint is happening too with uh with Michael Keaton and um and Ben Affleck doing their thing in Flashpoint but we'll see like who executes what better I guess um but overall like holy shit like when I saw that news I I did a double take I did a double take at like reading the headline because I got that from the um, Hollywood Reporter when I when I saw that link and I was like, wait, what is it? Oh, OK. Like, is he going to return like doing a, like a small voice thing? No, he's full force, full force opening up the multiverse. When I read that news, I was waking up. I opened my phone and I was convinced I was still sleeping. So I went back to sleep. I woke up and then I realized, oh, what? That wasn't a dream. <laughs> and he's like, oh, he, uh, Jamie Fox is legit coming back to, yeah, the, uh, not coming back, but he's entering into the MCU as a previously played character, playing the same character from the same universe and everything like that. And honestly, like, shit's gonna get weird and. About time, because the MCU needs a little bit of weirdness, I think. Because, like, where do you go after Endgame? Really? Where do you go? Uh, and, and it looked like it was going to get stale for a while, because it looked like... Because, let's be honest, um, other than, like, the big tentpole movies, like Thor Ragnarok, which it had to be good in order to set up what um, Infinity War and Endgame was and everything like that. Um, uh, Guardians, what we know guardians and all that shit but we it it looked like it was stale for a little bit for the mcu and it looked like it was going to be stale going forward as well because the thing is is that uh it felt like uh, we saw ant-man and the wasp and it wasn't really that good you know it was downright boring and it feels like they've run out of ideas but here they're throwing everything and the kitchen sink at the wall when it comes to this. I mean, let's 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 do a recap of what's going on in the in the Spider Verse of what's happening. Um, it's not confirmed, but it's pretty much confirmed that um, Michael Keaton is appearing as the Vulture at the end of Morbius or somewhere yeah. in yeah, in I'm Morbius. Bring that up that trailer I saw, and in that trailer itself, there was a poster of Spider Man called a murderer, but that was Tobey Maguire's Spider Man, the sp- the suit anyway, not or Andrew Garfield's. I forget which is which. And it's so weird, like, and also, um, like, v- Tom Holland was was slated to appear in Venom two, um, and just like these different things, and honestly. I think that this is pretty batshit insane and it needs to be. And I like it. Um, mm-hmm. The way that it's looking and everything. I don't know. How do you feel about this whole thing? That's a lot of stuff to kind of process at once. That, you know, we we probably should have seen it coming because I guess the hints were there, as you did say just now. Um, in the trailers and in some of their actions, um, I think to my to myself, well, if if the multiverse is in fact what they're doing, the clues have been there. First and foremost, they're making a film called Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. They're making mm-hmm. a Disney Plus, which is going to feature Wanda Maximoff, and in the meanwhile, they're making a Wanda Maximoff series in which. She is rumored to basically, or you could envision her unleashing the multiverse that then leads into the Doctor Strange film. Envision? Huh? Huh? Right, right. (laughs) Um, And then for what we know so far is in Spider-Man Far From Home, they had a whole scene where they talked about the multiverse. Mysterio's first, uh, his like fake origin story was that he came from a different uh, multiverse, if you will, a different dimension. There also was the appearance of J. Jonah Jameson, which featured, uh, which, you know, saw the reprisal from J.K. Simmons. At the same mm-hmm. time, we've known for several years that uh, Disney and Sony uh, 
we were never really sure of what a game plan was. And it seemed as if perhaps they have reached an agreement in which there are going – maybe Sony ends up uh, getting the most out of this in which their movies may now have – some indirect connections to the Marvel Cinematic Universe as and they could be explained as another side of the multiverse. We have Michael Keaton, as you say, appearing in the trailer for Morbius. Um, and you can already just start to see how a lot of this is going to come together. There have also been rumors uh, and speculation has already started about, you know, uh, Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire coming back, uh, whether it be in Spider-Man 3 or in Spider-Man 4 or wherever down the line that they may do that because they can do that now yeah. or introduce another Miles Morales. Um, I am very conflicted about this. And let me tell you why. Everything you're saying, everything you're saying and the enthusiasm in which you say it um, is just so weird and... It gets me interested somewhat in how they're going to pull that off. The other side of me, um, and this is basically Peter in my ear, uh, but mm. I will not be <laughs> as vicious as he was about it because um, – but I mean to be fair, he had some pretty good points. We had a discussion about this off air. Um, oh, this is my concern. Is it too much too soon? Because there's a lot of things flying in the air, a lot of characters. Because I think another speculation is that this is how Sony can finally make their Sinister Six film that they've had, you know, in the in in development in the works. hell yeah. for a long, long time, and you have all of these villains now that they can pull from. Um, I guess perhaps if uh, because it it feels as if. They're just throwing everything at the kitchen sink at once. And I wonder perhaps if this decision was arrived at because Sony and Disney have officially decided to part ways after the upcoming Spider-Man 3. And then Tom Holland goes back exclusively into the other multiverse where the Sony movies are going to be held at. That's just, I guess, one of the primary reasons why maybe Sony and Disney decided to go in this direction all of a sudden mm -hmm. um i guess from a narrative standpoint a couple of thing, things come to mind about this and that gets me a little bit concerned of course you're really really uh enlarging the cast ensemble for what these movies may be um in some respect I feel perhaps this event of the multiverse and uh, the the reunion of the three live action Spider Men may take away from Tom Holland's story. I mean, uh, from his Spider Man's, his Peter Parker's own story, mm -hmm. um, and not standing on its own. I I mean, I prefer for that character to have at least. His individual trilogy of films, first and foremost, I guess there's that. But there's also, and this is where Peter comes in. All right, so, because it, 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 this isn't just Spider-Man 3. I mean, we're talking about, because uh, we already mentioned WandaVision. We already mentioned Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. And it seems as if, and look, a lot of people hear this. And this is exciting, and this is a new direction the MCU is going to go to. And I guess, like, the multiverse idea is cool, but my fear is that it's going to become a gimmick in which they use as a crutch. Um, my concern is that they'll use this for pure spectacle of itself. And then that'll somehow justify some lackluster narrative developments. Because in a lot of this stuff, like, and I get it that we're all covering this right now because it is something unexpected and it is kind of the, the pizzazz, if you will, the bling that they're mm -hmm. bringing to these next new movies. But I also, 
I just think to myself in all of the videos that I'm watching of people covering these stories about the multiverse of madness, uh, not just that film, but the whole multiverse aspect that you want to introduce. And I, I hear like entire 20 minute conversations go by without a single mention of what, what, what this means for Dr. Strange's character. What's next for Wanda? What's next for Peter Parker? It's all, oh, this person's going to be here and that person's going to be there. Mm -hmm. And it creates this worry in me that we've already decided that the main priority from the Marvel Cinematic Universe perspective is we're going to give them more spectacle, which is going to allow us to not be as dynamic in our development and writing our characters for their personal journeys. One of the things that Peter Martinez brought up that was interesting and that he he kind of predicted in, in my conversation with him was this. Okay, so Spider-Man 3 is going to be that multiverse movie, or at least the first step or part in that since Electro was cast. What does that mean for the, the cliffhanger that Spider-Man Far From Home left off with like, Spe Peter Parker on the run? Wasn't that the movie that we were supposedly promised and now that's not really a big deal and it's going to be Peter opening up the multiverse? Is he really on the run though? Uh, that was the impression I got with that cliffhanger because he was framed by Mysterio as you and I both know. Uh -huh. And there are no Avengers anymore to step up and clear his name. So my, imp my impression was is he was successfully framed by Mysterio. Mysterio is somehow still alive and that Peter is going to go on the run to uh, save his name, basically. That's my impression anyway. That's not what I read at all. Well, I like not the um, Mysterio is still alive. I don't think Mysterio is coming back because like Jake Gyllenhaal, that's a big name to kind of have to bring back <laughs> um but the thing is is that i don't i don't i guess throughout the whole entire spider-man 3 i thought it was just going to be him dealing with the backlash of everybody knowing his identity i mean because like the thing is is that you know spider-man he was always you know painted as a menace by um by J. Jonah Jameson, by the press anyway, in Spider-Man history, that I thought this was just gonna be another day in the day in the life as, you know, Peter Parker. So that's what I read as uh as Peter Parker's uh plight for Spider-Man three. It's just this is gonna be his first taste of what that's like. Well which is also uh something we've never seen before in the live action films in which Peter Parker's identity is revealed to the public. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have to imagine on some level, a lot of the movie in Spider-Man three is going to be dealing with that question, right? It's just not going to like start the movie with everyone's cool and everything. And now we're into this new story. Yeah. I, again, like when you're looking at Spider-Man three, the MCU Spider-Man three, you're looking at like an outline you're not looking at like the meat you're not looking at like the the um the you're just looking at like bullet points of the movie so far we don't know right. what the what the overall movie is i'm just willing to wait to see what they have to offer and how this executes and uh, yeah obviously we're not we, i don't want to prejudge anything i just I, I these are just concerns that i have and based on previous behavior and we mentioned this i think we we talked about this in the in the a few weeks ago about how marvel does have a history of teasing a lot of really cool ideas but then giving us like 5 seconds of it and not following through on them yeah um and also i could see what you're what you're saying about like the gimmick thing and can how, it like... be overdone cuz it's not just like all right so what we know so far is doctor strange which uh -huh. in and of itself is a weird kind of like a multiverse thing because Doctor Strange was mentioned in the Raimi movies and then Raimi himself, which directed those Spider-Man movies, is now directing Doctor Strange. Uh -huh. So weird. 
how that does just all come together. Maybe that's are, why. Maybe that's why we, Sam Raimi was, you know, recruited by Kevin Feige. Are we? Are we expecting? Well, first of all, Sam Raimi loves the shit out of Doctor Strange. Mm-hmm. Um, but secondly, um, the thing is, is that could that mean Toby appears? <laughs> <laughs> in a half end credit sequence thing who like honestly at this point who the fuck knows what's going on mm-hmm. um and i i think that's what makes me excited because i i before before the announcement of electro and everything like that i i felt like i had a firm grip of what was going on mm, okay so this brought a little bit of spontaneity into the marvel cinematic universe to kind of reignited that interest and like okay this is weird i want to see how they do this kind of stuff yeah because like then everything goes into question of like how they're going to handle phase four four or five this is phase four yeah Yeah. um handling phase four in this regard because i was just like okay whoa it's like 2016 all over again we don't know what the state of this phase is gonna be if you catch my drift (laughs) um but like I, it, that's what got me interested and excited because I have, honestly, I had a grip of what was going on in the MCU and it was looking pretty boring. Um, the only thing I was like firmly, firmly excited for was, um, Thor Love and Thunder, but now, holy shit, like this is really exciting because I have no idea what they have planned now. We should mention um, with the dot, with the multiverse of madness, there have been ongoing rumors that um, a lot of the stuff that's coming um, has been borrowed, not borrowed, but like Kevin Feige is basically um, trying to, you know, challenge the whole flashpoint movie and their multiverse movie, which that is, I think the, the first one that was greenlit in that, with multiverse of madness, there is the potential for like these big, big name actors like Tom Cruise or John Krasinski to appear as like different versions of the Avengers. There was this rumor that Tom Cruise could be like an alternate multiverse reality of, uh, what's his Tony name? Stark, Tony Stark and everything. And that aspect, if that is going to happen, I would hope that that would be a very limited cameo. Because I think we need to move beyond Tony Stark and yeah. beyond. We need to move beyond the original Avengers. I think we need to get past that. So that particular part, I'm not so thrilled by. And it is a little bit disconcerting for what the priority of that movie is. And there's also this question about audiences maybe getting too flamed out on multiverse movies. You said in, in, in your statement earlier um about who is going to do it better, who's going to do it first. Well, mm-hmm. if we look at the current release schedule, which why we why we would trust it, I don't know. But currently, Spider Man Three is supposed to be coming out Christmas of two thousand and twenty one. Uh, Flashpoint, I believe, would not start filming. Well, actually, I think it's supposed to. It should have started filming now, or could have started filming now. So I don't remember when exactly Flashpoint is coming out. I would imagine late 2021 or early 2022 is like the the area in which that would happen. And in that movie, uh, they're they're doing that stuff too with Michael Keaton coming back as Batman, um, and other stuff. Uh, ben Affleck also returning as Batman uh, for what is reportedly his like final hurrah at, in the role as Batman. Um, do you think there's the potential for audiences to get a little flamed out on multiverse? No, because no. like audiences love this shit. They they absolutely love that novelty. They're like, "Oh, it's that thing I know." You know, we all we all know that. Mm. Uh so I I don't think that they're going to be flamed out by it. Um I think it just depends on execution and how they execute everything. Right. To be honest, I think that that's going to be the um, the goal going forward. I guess like how things are being taken care of and handled in in that regard before audiences go like oh this, this again because again 
in a live action setting, this is new territory. Right. And I think that everybody loves new territory. Like when, I mean, it, it's a repeat of when freaking uh, uh, Tony Stark appeared at the end of freaking the incredible Hulk. And they were like, Oh, so the Avengers are going to become a thing. And then Captain America came out and Thor and so on and so on. And, the list goes on. So, like, the the novelty from back then is being um, reutilized here, but in a different way. So, I think that this is just going to be new territory, and I don't think everybody's going to be flamed out by the multiverse. Just yet. Just yet. Um, we'll see in five years. Five or ten years. The way that um, release schedules are being <laughs> treated. Well, I mean, that, uh, let's uh, bring in some of these other stories that we have here that are related to the MCU that would kind of also paint the, like, give people a good indication of, like, what to expect. So what does that mean, th this exploration of the multiverse in the films? What does it mean for the Disney Plus series? Like Miss Marvel, who they cast this week, um, Iman Velanito, uh, right? Is that her name? Let me check. Iman Villanito uh, was cast as Kamala Khan, uh, Miss Marvel, for the Disney Plus series that was announced, I believe, last year. Villani. Villani? Yeah. Iman Villani. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, I put Villani and two as one word on my notes. Excuse me. Yeah, Iman Villani, excuse me, to star in Miss Marvel. Uh, got a lot of praise uh, for her being, uh, you know, cast as the official ethnicity of the comic book character, mm -hmm. which is good overall for the, you know, the industry and good press for them. Also, uh, she's I, a fellow yeah. Letterboxd user. <laughs> is she? That's interesting. Uh, and then we also have the Nick Fury show that was announced in which some are speculating that it's going to be the Secret Invasion series with... Uh, the scrolls coming back and they pointed to a throwaway line in Spider-Man far from home where fake Nick Fury really Talos um, is caught in mid conversation toward the end of the, f toward the transition to the third act of him talking about Cree sleeper cells hidden on earth. So maybe that could be a clue as to what the show is going to be doing. Blah, blah. Uh, where do you think all that fits in to this whole multiverse thing? Do you think the multiverse is going to be extended to these shows on Disney Plus or what? I thought I had an idea. Mm -hmm. And then Jamie Foxx was casted and I was like, fuck if I know. <laughs> that, okay, that's the thing though. Going back to the whole thing, that's what makes me excited about Phase 4. Because I have no idea what's going on anymore. Mm. Like, could... And again, that makes me more excited for these projects in a way, loosely, because like I'm like, that this is typical comic book shit. Like, things could be jumbled around, timelines could be fucked around. I mean, let's be honest, the timeline was pretty fucked in Endgame. I mean, all bets were off <laughs> when, when that happened. But like, when it when it comes to like this. I, I think that that is where the 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 lines of like, where does this fit in or where does this fit in? I think the point is it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> it doesn't matter where everything fits in. It's loosely connected. Like a lot of these things are loosely connected. But overall, in the grand scheme of things, you you might as well be looking for Pepe Silva. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, if you don't, if you don't know what that is, that's a always sunny in Philadelphia reference where, uh, where, uh, Charlie, he was like wondering who the fuck a uh, Pepe Silva was. And, um, because he's illiterate and he didn't read Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, so that, that, that's the whole thing. Like, I think that this, like, again, great. Okay. To go to the news things that you that you mentioned um Amanda Smith Marvel great I think it's great I think it's great that there it's a newcomer that they're a newcomer um mm -hmm. coming into this you know stepping up to play and I like that they're inviting new people not just like big big you know bombastic names and everything like that because you could have easily done like a stunt casting but no it's a newcomer and I think that's really nice um Nick Fury um 
just to see Sam Jackson do his thing. I think that's great. And having him um, do that stuff, I think, is fantastic. Uh, I want to see more. Um, we mentioned it before on a, on the Fantasy Fair already, but, like, bring in Ben Mendelsohn. Bring in, like, different things like that. Because, honestly, like, this has the potential of being some some good space shit. And I, honestly, space I think- spy stuff. Uh, I love it. I think this, in, in many ways, this could be, like, the... Um, not in continuity because we know that, that the Feige, uh, mentality will never address Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's fine. And I've gotten over it, but this could be in spirit, the successor in a way to that kind of stuff that I'm interested into, like X-Files kind of things, uh, mm-hmm. with, a you know, underground spy show thriller aspect to it with Nick Fury, who I love and I would love to see more of as well as Talos. So, you know what? Um, this may be the one that I'm most excited to see and look forward to because I do believe okay. this one has uh, the potential to be a long-standing series, whereas a lot of these other shows like WandaVision or Falcon and Winter Soldier have much more of a mini-series, limited series appeal to them. Right. Um, so if done well, I and I think they got... They they said that Mr. Robot, one of the guys that did Mr. Robot, um, is attached to produce the series. So yeah, from what I read. So we, again, again, that's if this is the direction that we're going to. They have not officially announced what this Nick Fury show is going to be. Uh, whether it this could be Agents of Sword, this could be the what we were talking about. Right, I think there is enough reason to believe, and there have been certain people out there that have been pointing to this that that, on the inside that this is the direction they're going to go into the secret invasion which is i think what people want from the scrolls involved as well as the kree i also do want to see more of that uh i i'm not sure if captain marvel 2 is going to address whatever happened with the war between the war and the kree but maybe this show can and will do that um and i was interested in what was happening there and Mm -hmm. hopefully that this show will do it but this is just uh, uh, a really uh, quickly expanding uh, cinematic universe. And I guess to me, I have no doubt that at the very least, what they're going to produce and everything will be entertaining and will be great spectacle and fun. Um, I just, I would hope though, that they do, um, that this is a sign that they are going to try harder to make better projects, to make the quality of the films themselves be more than just the bare to bones Marvel formula, which speaking for myself and maybe you, um, we're beginning to feel tired with when you look at Ant-Man and the Wasp, mm-hmm. some, some of it with Captain Marvel, some of it with Black Panther, although to much better results than Ant-Man and the Wasp. But overall, there has been this feeling, even the original Doctor Strange film, that the 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 formula that that as that was is beginning to get was beginning to get stale and i think mm-hmm. is at this moment so i think we're all on the same page that we would hope that they are shaking things up in a direction that is much more substantive um creative yeah i, I like the creative shit that's behind all that um i will say because uh if peter martinez finds his way into listening to this podcast and if you listen to this right now i do want to say uh for the record peter is very pessimistic and is outright dismissive of all of this so it, just to get his thoughts out there that's where he stands on i'm sure the next time that we talk about this we'll, we'll get peter's full accounting for it all but i do want to know that um Peter was not on this show because we had scheduled another recording, and so I don't want to overwhelm him. But okay. uh, I have a feeling we're going to be hearing uh, a message from him out of out of the random where he is attacking uh, the conversation being had right now. Oh, um, this! Uh, if he was on this panel right now as we speak, this would have gone I don't know another hour. <laughs> yeah, and perhaps uh, we shouldn't. Uh, do anymore anything else to say on the marvel stuff coming up um i'm cautiously optimistic with all this stuff i mean Mm -hmm. it's just it it, that the whole jamie fox thing just threw me out of the loop and i was just like okay 
we're getting weird and funky and i have no idea what's going on and hopefully marvel will stay spunky <laughs> okay uh i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna move past that comment um and let's get into barry jenkins uh who if people are not aware of was an amazing filmmaker uh if beale street could talk incredible film that came out a few years ago and then of course moonlight which did win best picture um is now directing a follow-up to the live action lion king movie if i recall correctly did gross at least 1.6 billion dollars worldwide uh officially the highest grossing film in the entire history of the walt disney studio um live action not including Star Wars or Marvel or anything else, just the studio itself. And technically animated too? Well, well, yeah, I meant like, well, in particular, it. I would assume so. Yes, I think Frozen 2 was up there and so was Frozen. So I'm not sure. I, it, it technically may be the highest grossing movie that Disney has ever done, period. The yeah, Lion King live action remake. Fucking disgusting. For but... those not aware of it, although you should be aware of it at this point, uh, the Lion King live action film was unanimously uh, dismissed as trash by just about every single person on this panel, on this you know podcast group. Uh, the live-action remakes in general are much maligned for, by our group in general. We are so fucking tired of them, and a lot of them end up being horrifying um, and, and j they're just plain bad movies. Hard hard to digest it, but none more so i feel than the lion king that one i think was i think objectively the worst one of them all it, it made me want to die i felt embarrassed being in that room <laughs> i did too i Just, wanted to escape me too but we were already balls deep so this feels like two things at once it feels like a complete surprise, and yet at the same time, it feels as if this is something we should have seen coming a mile away. A mm. mile away. Because what Peter had been saying for a while is, with the release of Mulan and then, of course, Little Mermaids, presumably next year or the following year, that's it. All of Disney's A-list potential for remakes have been used up. Well, Disney found a way to, like, fuck him over subsequently the rest of us by saying you thought we were done no now we're gonna have direct sequels to those live action remakes for more easy billion dollar grossing movies when i read this news i do not this is this is not hyperbole this is not an over exaggeration i felt sick to my stomach and i think i wanted to throw up by how disgusted I was by this news. And do not think for any moment... I know that, that the, the Disney Toon Studios directed DVD sequels are, are well known from the community, like Simba's Pride and Linking One and a Half or other ones. Do not think for a moment that they're going to do direct translations or copies of those movies. They're going to go in a different direction. And in that aspect, perhaps there does, perhaps the smallest chance for some kind of creativity, for some kind of... Anything that resembles the word good or decent. With Barry Jenkins being involved, it is a weird, weird curveball that I never would have expected. Yeah. It concerns me a little bit, though, that perhaps he is being coerced into doing this. That way he remains at the Searchlight Studios, which Disney has just recently acquired through the Fox buyout. That way he can make more of his original movies. Although it is a big chance for him to earn a big paycheck as well. Yeah. There is some potential. It is weird, but you also can't get over this fact. How f incredibly abysmal and disappointing Alan Horn is from the Walt to the Walt Disney Studio from a critical and creative standpoint, not a financial standpoint. He's been maybe, maybe the most successful the studio has ever had. From a creative standpoint, his films are bad. Just bad. What do you make of this, Kyle? First of all, can we... They're, they are remaking a movie within this movie, uh, within the, the Lion King sequel, but it isn't Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. It's uh, it's actually The Godfather 2. That they're, I forgot um... to mention that. 
I forgot to mention that. I had blocked that from my memory. And now that you mentioned that, I'm going to go throw up. Excuse me. Okay, go throw up. Um, But the thing is, is that that's what shocked me most. Because, like, I think, like, the whole entire Disney community unanimously agrees that they love Simba's pride. So, like, it, it would be a no-brainer to do that. But instead, they're doing Godfather 2, where they're exploring Mufasa's past. And It's like going to doing... be a half-and-half half movie, from what I remember hearing, is that they're going to explore Mufasa's origin story. Can you think of a more hideous thing to do? It's it, it's not enough that you already copied and ripped off your own movie, but now you're just going to completely rip off another one? Yeah. Because they're running out. Uh, I hate yeah. this idea. I there, hate it. You see, there was the potential with Barry Jenkins involved, but now that you reminded me of what, they're, what they plan to do, fuck that movie. But, yeah, so... They're exploring. It's going to be a prequel slash sequel. Oh. Me- meanwhile, they're exploring Simba's, like, I guess, first year as king <laughs> in the Pride Lands. Okay. Uh, like, what? <laughs> exactly. What is this? What the fuck? Who asked for this plot? Nobody. You know, I would have been more appreciative of them saying, like, hey, we're doing Simba's Pride. Because, like, I would be like, okay, I get it, you know, and everything like that. But this makes absolutely no goddamn sense whatsoever. No, Again, nobody asked for this. This is... Uh, this is pleasing nobody. Ugh. Uh, this I I think maybe yeah. perhaps the worst of this is it may set up a dangerous precedent in which these Searchlight Studio uh, people like Barry Jenkins have to prove their worth to Disney and they have to helm a blockbuster like this. If you're keeping score, this is the second one after Taika Waititi, who was announced earlier this year to be helming a Star Wars movie, uh, and that sounds amazing. Uh, mm-hmm. great. I think good for him. I think they, they know that he can do something not only great, but then great in Star Wars. But you also kind of create a pattern now in which a lot of these great filmmakers at Searchlight Studios, which, if you don't remember, uh, created such Best Picture award-winning movies like Moonlight, 12 Years a Slave, The Shape of Water, and so on and so forth, that now that they if they want to do an original movie with them – they need to do uh, a blockbuster. And it would be one thing, perhaps, if they would let them do what they wanted with the blockbusters. But it's hard to believe uh-huh. that this idea to rip off The Godfather Part Two came from Barry Jenkins. And he's just basically, you know what? Fine. I'll do it. I'll, I'll Thank you for the free money. And then I'll use this for my the, the next movie that I really want to do. But it's just hard to believe that he really wants to be a part of this. And it gets a little bit terrifying to be what, what Disney might be forcing um, a lot of these filmmakers to do. Which, it's weird, right? Like, it, you mentioned, like, you know, capable of all this stuff. Like, didn't, didn't his film win an Oscar? I mean... His film won an Oscar. You would think that he doesn't have to prove himself because of that. But, like, I don't know. He may not have a choice in the matter. I guess if there's a project he wants to get funded by Disney at that studio, he may have to, okay, I'll do one for you, do one for me kind of a thing. Which is not that uncommon in this Hollywood system or this modern day. Which we should also mention, of course, is also being constantly changed because of coronavirus. So you scratch my back, I scratch yours kind of yeah, deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's not necessarily new as we said. So yeah, this, 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 this is awful. Anything else to say about this? <sighs> no, I feel like, um, 10 years was taken away from my life just talking about it. So let's move <laughs> on. All right.
right. Well, speaking of uh, time being taken away from Kyle Lyra's James Bond, No Time to Die was announced by MGM this last week that it will be moving from its November release date um, all the way to April of 2021, which I think at that point would have made it an entire year that the movie has been delayed, which is not uncommon these days. A lot of movies are going to be ended up delayed by an entire year. Um, I will say... Um, we should talk about Kyle, uh, just, just the luck that you seem to have. Sometimes you literally, I think reached out to Kyle, uh, Peter and myself about, uh, perhaps investing in a private screening at a theater nearby to go see this movie as it seemed to be mm-hmm. the only big release left until Christmas. And then of course the following morning it happened. <laughs> Yeah, I was having my coffee and all that shit, and I was just like, okay, let me see. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Um, politics, politics, politics. Oh, James Bond. Let's see. Let's see what. Oh, right. It's being postponed yet again. Okay. All right. <laughs> and I and I went into the. Um, into the in into the shower cut my hair off uh, shaved it off uh um drank uh 10 bottles of jägermeister um went into a complete bananas uh, state um i took all the leather jackets i have in my freaking um closet turned that into a cat suit um and turn into Catwoman because Catwoman hear me roar and I was just completely bashed and insane after that because I was just like yeah you know what I mean I shouldn't be surprised but yet I am because like again like the promo you know the promo circuit started getting rolling again um Nokia released um an ad with Lashana Lynch in the in the thing again um uh dhl um did the whole thing uh and also like the new trailer uh billy eilish she you know her new uh, music video came out i mean just like the the ball was rolling like it was going again and also apparently next week on next monday um daniel craig is supposed to be on fallon with billy eilish performing well uh I don't see the point in doing that anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, like, it just... Imagine how the the the, um, the the press people must be, or, like, the marketing team, just be like, oh, okay, okay, finally we're going to get back to work and doing all this stuff. And no, on the plus side, they get to reuse all their, um, all their April posters again they i guess they they can do that and another plus side to this is that um from what i it seemed as if they were on the precipice with the media appearances by craig and billy eilish to once again begin the marketing campaign in full for the november release date it appears as if they didn't spend much of that money at all And so they still have that on reserve for the next marketing campaign uh, in April, if indeed that is when things are. Because, I mean, it's not as if this is going to go away in 2021, January, uh, you know, at midnight. Um, Hopefully, as as we've been saying a long time that other shows won't say, uh, coronavirus has been exacerbated because American culture has permitted it to be so. People refuse to wear masks. That is abated by the current COVID-19 uh, person in chief, President Trump. If he is removed from office with Joe Biden, the potential then can begin uh, for things to get better is much greater than if he were to get reelected, because if he were to get reelected, then we may never see movies again. It It is as simple as that. I think we agree on that situation because um, it's fact. Um it just is that way because uh, the president has COVID now and he just said today that you don't, you shouldn't let COVID uh, I think scare you or ruin your life or something like that. don't be scared of it is what he said. So that clearly is working out for 210,000 people who've just died from COVID-19 this year. Um, but to James Bond, I feel that overall you should be happy for this, even though this is personally vexing about this game of cat and mouse uh, and, and constantly teasing you. Uh, uh, from like, oh, we're going to get it. We're, we're getting closer and closer and closer. And then right as we're about to get the 
to it, it gets the, the rug Snatched gets pulled out again. from under you. Yeah. But I, like I did tell you, though, you should have seen it coming. And I think you did to an extent because not all, every other movie already moved. But for the benefit and for the I think the uh, for the benefit of the movie, if we want the movie to do well and, to, and you know, and, and by doing well, you know, being a box office hit all over the world. And as they said in their statement, I believe uh, it is best to wait when we can return in w- to a time where movie going is back in general, because we've seen this past month and a half uh, to two months, certain movies be sacrificed at the altar to try and revive cinema. Mm-hmm. Most of all, namely Tenet by Christopher Nolan, which um, failed, which failed um, completely, completely failed. And in and in fact, instead of being the savior of cinema, it has now put the smaller theaters in uh, in a closer space to death than they were beforehand. So, it just isn't the time, as the title says. Like the title says, it's no time to die. It, it, it should cling to that title because if it had released in November, it would have been a miserable disaster. Yeah. Um. Again. Like, uh, for the sake of the movie, like, I'm glad it got pushed. And we should know, PVOD would never have been an option. MGM, this is MGM, or this is, uh, this is like, the big franchise. You yeah. need it to be in a theatrical, and I'm, I would doubt, from everything I hear and suspect about how old-fashioned the Broccoli's are, that PVOD would be something that they would embrace. That was like, gonna I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, the thing, is, okay, like for the sake of the movie, I'm I'm ex- absolutely thrilled that they're moving it, uh, moving it because like this is Dan Craig's final final go around as Bond, and you want to have a lot as much pomp and circumstance as you can about his his departure. Um, for me personally, it's been just like. I, I'm I'm not gonna get it, am I? <laughs> um, but and like a lot of people are saying April. Um, I'm I'm suspecting we're gonna get another move when we get closer to that date. Um, I think because we have no idea when the season of regular movie going will come back at all. Because yeah. even if Biden is inaugurated in January, there will be a time in which his uh his changes in government for that to have an effect. And so will there be enough time between January of 2021 and April of 2021, you know, for the coronavirus yeah. to improve? Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'm I'm looking at 20 like late 2021 or back in April of 2022 that we're going to get no time to die. And also, here's the thing. Here's the thing with no uh 20 uh 22, that's going to be the 60 year anniversary of of uh of james bond and i like that would be the perfect opportunity to kind of release a james bond movie in that year but yet again it's just been so long since like it's been completed that it, it's just a a mishap of just a leading list of circumstances that led to it being postponed so many times um but uh, I would say like the safe bet is November 2021 when we're actually going to sit down and honestly I'm not going to believe again like how like James Cameron's Avatar sequels are <laughs> I'm not I'm not going to be um I'm not going to be convinced that I actually saw the movie until I see at the end credits James Bond will return <laughs> um and I, I, I'm not going to believe that the movie I- exists until then. Um, trailers, they could sh- show me whatever trailers they want. They could show me pretty much the entire movie in a trailer form. I'm still not going to be convinced that this movie exists <laughs> um, until then. So, uh, yeah. So far, Spectre is the last James Bond movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> until then but yeah i mean release dates are release dates and this is their the release latter. dates and i mean since we were talking about marvel uh, we didn't mention it before but it, it is obvious and i think we kind of suspected 2020 is the first year since 2009 
uh, in which there would have been no Marvel movie released. Yeah. That's huge. Also, it's like, it, it's a bewilderment in like how, how like much Marvel has done. Yeah. In, in, in that Well, if you frame. look at 2021 and if that schedule remains, there could be the first year where they have four films released. Black Widow, Eternals, Shang-Chi, and then Spider-Man 3. Just weird. Really weird. Um, but yeah, James Bond, I, I'm, 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 I'm done grieving. I, I just, like, <laughs> you've accepted the death. <laughs> I, I've expected that I, <laughs> I, yeah, no well, time look. to die. It, 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 it's pretty much dead until, right. Until I see well, James movies Bond are will return dead. in the credit. Movie theaters are dead until they come back because of the situation that we're in right now. And, um, There are a lot of great projects that, you know, on the one hand, this fucking sucks for the studios and for the exhibitors and for subsequently all of us who can't get them. Mm -hmm. You still want these projects like Dune, for example, to be released in an environment in which it is able to do the best that it possibly can for the sake of the the, 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 the existence of that franchise. Because in the best of circumstances, as we've said, with science fiction films like those, like pure science fiction, not science fantasy like Dune, um, have a hard time appealing to um, wide audiences uh, and, and then make really little money. Um, and we had talked previously about Warner Brothers saying that it's fine. We're going to have Dune and Wonder Woman released at the exact same week at Christmas, and we'll own the box office. Well, their own movie right now, Tenant, is kind of, uh, if you didn't see the box office this last week, it was a photo finish between that and Hocus Pocus to win the box office. That should tell you how bad things are right now. (laughs) Which, by the way, Hocus Pocus... Is an amazing movie, and I'm even though it's available on Disney Plus and on TV, the fact that people are still going to movie theaters to see it, I think yeah. speaks well for its legacy. You know, um, even in the middle of a freaking pandemic, I think right? that's incredible. <laughs> I'm sure some drive-ins are are playing Hocus Pocus somewhere. Yeah. Oh God, I would love to do that. I'd love to go to a drive-in and see Hocus Pocus. I think that'd be a good retro kind of kind of time because it is a retro movie in itself and i think that would be fun i i have recently like within the past weekend i re- recently uh re-watched hocus pocus and it, it, it just, it's just the it's, season it's, it's the time it still gives me goosebumps i still love the movie i, I like the divine miss m is still divine <laughs> in the movie um i just love it I was talking to uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Deanna Gastello, oh. about about it, and we were uh, we were just gushing over. She was like, "Is there anybody here who loves Hocus Pocus as I do?" And I was like, uh, uh, "Excuse me, <laughs> okay, <laughs> excuse me." Uh, but yeah, we we talked about it, and it was just a, uh, it was just an awesome. It, it, it's still awesome, and it still holds up. I think it gets better with age actually a lot of movies like that do especially since you know we just talked about how miserable uh the live action slate for the disney studio has been these this last decade and it's so incomprehensible to believe that at one point disney made movies like hocus pocus yeah that were good really good (laughs) emphasis on good yeah um but yeah hocus pocus good and also like uh unrelated but apparently, like Kathy Najimy, uh, Bette Midler, and Sarah Jessica Parker, um, signed a secret um, a contract uh, upon um, uh, it, when a uh, Hocus Pocus two um, returns. So they're they're for sure going to be in it. Um, whenever Hocus Pocus two happens, so I'm, I'm excited for that. Wonder how that's going to be. Um, they should get a move on that. I feel. Yeah um it's doing really well on disney plus trending from what i saw and disney plus i think created a special halloween page uh over the weekend if you didn't see yeah for all the stuff that they have also if you have disney plus there's also the trivia or treat 
um edition of hocus pocus which i which i watched um and it has like a bunch of like um storyboards and trivia and all that stuff while the movie is playing interviews from different cast members and everything like that so i think that's really fun if you're a a, a hocus pocus die hard right such as i <laughs> to the point though uh movies can't make a profit much less break even right now so dune has been moved to october almost a full year of 2021 i think that's a smart decision uh, just get it as far away from the big tent poles. If movies do come back in April, it's going to be a really, really packed summer blo- uh, summer blo- blockbuster season if that does happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but then with Dune being sent to October, that uh, is taking the date of the Batman. Matt Reeves is the Batman. And so while it was not officially confirmed... People are, I think, taking a reasonable, logical guess here that it's going to be sent off to 2022. Yeah. But again, like, it, I don't know if you've addressed this on the podcast before. Um, Robert Pattinson tested positive for COVID. <laughs> so again, like production had to be delayed and everything like they're that. Back so. that. They're shooting now. He got over it. Oh, you got over it? Okay. Yeah, I, I read that about a few weeks ago. So it, it didn't last. It shouldn't have been more than like a week and a half or two weeks. He, I'm sure like he got over it and then like they went back. And although I don't know if they observed or, or they complied with the 14 day period of uh, self-isolation. Well, it's the Hollywood. White House, you know, the they White didn't. House isn't doing that. The president isn't doing that. And so no. apparently you can get over COVID in three days and you're fine and you're strong. Yeah, it's just a small cold. That's it. Just take some day quill, you're good. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but it's not the last will be, like, because I think they also, there have been some other, like, uh, f- productions that have had to, like, hit the pause button several times because of COVID tests. So, like, this won't be the last we hear of no. stuff like this happening. Uh, Bill and Ted Face the Music uh, did very well for itself on premium VOD. Uh, releasing their numbers as $32 million. And that may not sound great overall. Um, It pretty much did the same as Tenet did theatrically in as many as four weeks at the domestic box office. Whoa. Yeah. I haven't seen it, did you? I have not. Peter really liked it. Um, I am planning on seeing it before the year end. The, the, the year ends. So okay. Are we still doing the twenty twenty uh, year list? <laughs> Peter is adamant that we do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to see it because otherwise I don't know how I'll get to a top ten list. Yeah. Uh, without it, you know. So because it's a uh, slim pickings this year. <laughs> Yeah, which is why I think uh, we've mainly uh, transitioned to covering TV uh, over the last yeah, few months. Yeah, because TV is ever ever going. Yeah, so that that is encouraging, at least on a, on a smaller scale, that perhaps films like Bill and Ted are small budget or mid budget dramas uh, and or comedies of any genre could be profitable on premium VOD. Uh, but we definitely know that if you're uh, a big budget movie, that is kind of impossible to do anything good on, on PVOD. But ironically enough, Tenant may need, um, to pull some great numbers once it makes its debut on digital to Mm -hmm. break even. Because right now it reached $300 million worldwide, which was what it was expected to do. But it needs to hit 500 to break even, and that's not going to happen. So ironically enough, Mr. Uh, I'm going to save the theaters, his film might need to be saved by digital, period. And honestly, that's the way cinema should be viewed. (laughs) Uh, this is cinema. You know what? Honestly, I was thinking about this while I was doing my my uh my chores for the day. Um, like it's so funny. 
honestly, I shouldn't like nobody should be listening to Martin Scorsese um about like cinema and all that stuff because he appeared in Shark Tale. <laughs> Or worse yet, Christopher Nolan, who uh, willingly uh, put his own fans in danger by pushing the reopening of cinema because he needed to hear how much they liked his movie. That's an actual uh, paraphrase of a quote he said from a few weeks back that we aired, that we read on this uh, podcast. Um, I'll just say it. I'm glad he failed uh, because this was reckless and stupid to begin with. And I'm still hearing people say that there could have been a chance in which movies could have been successful somehow in this pandemic. That was never going to happen. It just wasn't. They tried, and guess what happened? It was a disaster for everybody involved. And as bad as it was for the Tenet's performance about losing money and the studio losing money, it was actually worse for the theaters that they forced to reopen because, well, we, the big news over the weekend was that Cineworld, the owner of Regal, announced that it would be closing its theaters in the United States and in the UK, which, and they base off their decision on basically everyone having moved away, all the movies having moved away from the release dates with no time to die, supposedly being the last straw as to why they would bother to keep opening uh, with theaters reducing their hours, some theaters being op open only on the weekends now, which is only then going... I'm, I'm just waiting for the shoe to drop of how many uh, employees are fired and laid off in the next few mm -hmm. weeks all across the country and all across the world. You know, this would have been you know easily taken care of if they converted their parking lots into drive-ins. I don't know... Why? What if they just, I don't know, work together to do something, but instead they all chose to go it alone when it was entirely predictable what was going to happen. And instead of like trying to like, you know, get local governments and federal governments to reopen, why not then just band together and beg, as you should, the federal government to bail you out? As right now, James Cameron and Clint Eastwood, with some like Regal, are working together to form a case before the federal government to do that. Why are you doing that now? After this failed attempt? This should have been done a long time ago. Because they were betting on the wrong horse. And now they're fucked. Because, like, the only thing that was had any sliver of hope just, like, bailed out the window um, last week. So, I... <laughs> Uh, I, I I guess it's easier said than done, but like this is just common sense, really. It is, and we should know that that the uh, CEO of Cineworld said that in large part we had to make this, this decision because the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, was mean to us. And he didn't let us open in the middle of a pandemic, and he chose to keep people safe instead of pushing. You know, people into a theater, which a lot of people covering this business seem to think that it's perfectly safe to do so because you feel safe. You're not at all safe if you're sitting in a dark room with no air being filtrated. How do you think President Trump got the coronavirus? Because he was in an enclosed small space with the same people who all tested positive over the weekend in a prolonged period of time. It is absolutely irrefutable to suggest that a theater right now is the most dangerous place you could be in. And so they're blaming it on the governor that chose to keep them closed. At the same time, where Disney lays off 28,000 people all across the country from the theme parks, and and I'm so disappointed in Mr. Um, DeMauro for... And I, I don't even know... If this was his decision or if it was Bob Chapik or if it was Bob Iger, who knows who the fuck is in charge of that company at this point. But for him to suggest that – or for him to blame Governor Newsom for refusing to let them open in the middle of a pandemic as the reason for why they had to lay off 28,000 employees. Meanwhile, a month earlier, they restored the full pay of their executives all across the board. So this idea of like – these two entities 
from the theme parks, the industries, the theme parks, the movie theaters, blaming Democratic governors for choosing to keep people safe instead of the fucking president of the United States who has refused to sign a national mask mandate, has repeatedly made fun of masks, said COVID isn't dangerous, got diagnosed this past week, and still refuses to say that it is dangerous, you should be afraid of it. Really? Really? Why would anybody defend you when you're being this fucking stupid? It's so funny how, like, the 1% sit comfortably in a socialistic, um... Capital, uh, well, yeah, you're right. Socialistic, um... Corporate socialism, is what you're referring to. An you're integral right. thing, while the rest of them, uh, we, we live in a, a vicious capitalistic, uh, society for the rest of us. I think that's... I, I think it's funny and downright depressing at the same time. Yeah. Fu it's fu pressing. <laughs> um but I I'm just I'm just I'm just done. I stay off as you know, I stay off of Twitter as much as I can, except for the mornings when I'm getting my information and all that stuff, but it's not fun. It's not fun living right now. It is, it's absolutely not. Um, like, 2020 was supposed to be like, yeah, let, let's do this and all that stuff. Meanwhile, the society is barely hanging on a thread and, you know, government is, is freaking crumbling before our very eyes. Um, numbers keep on getting higher. Um and honestly, like, this is just one of the things that is just like the cream of the crop of what's been happening uh, with the whole movie situation. Like, you could have easily like across the nation, you could have easily made um, uh, parking lots, infrastructures into perfectly sound and stable drive in theaters but instead they wanted to wait and rely on one film to save them all and when they it's ridiculous how they were like well if pv if pvod is barely hanging on a thread what makes people think that people are gonna go out physically and see these movies i'm who what kind of crack pipe are these people smoking and can I have some? <laughs> um, because it's it's just getting downright stupid. Like the way businesses have been operating. Like you're seeing, you're starting to see the true colors of these businesses during this pandemic, and how they they treat their you know facilities, and how people respond in panic. And honestly, it's pretty freaking terrifying how people are viewed in that. Uh, regard so I don't know there, there's a there's a lot of shit on the table that I think shouldn't be on the table and a few changes here and there I think could have easily saved movie theaters but instead they did it to themselves yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm I'm done I'm done. As, I, as am I. We'll continue to update the situation whenever it gets worse, and it will get worse. Well, thank you all for listening so much. Remember, our shows every Sunday, sometimes on Thursdays, we have audio commentaries coming up for The Shining and Doctor Sleep, as well as a review for The Haunting of Blind Manor, and to the tables, Ghost Dober, uh, with The Sixth Sense, Poltergeist, and so much more coming up. Thank you, Kyle, for being here. Fantasy Fair also uh, Fridays with their own uh, Halloween stuff coming up as well. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for being here. And, and next uh little uh minor update next month is going to be muppet month on um Ooh. on uh, the fantasy fair okay. with uh we're reviewing the movies for the muppet movie um uh, the great muppet caper uh muppets take manhattan the muppets and muppets most wanted all in november okay so. that sounds fun well thank you all uh stay under the spotlight here under our wonderful spotlight of all of these beautiful podcasts as we say they're immaculate as the president says the best podcasts you'll ever hear uh, we have the really, best podcast we have the best podcast hope you enjoy international uh podcast day or was it was a national podcast day whichever yeah. it was oh and enjoy uh today it's late late as hell 
but um, for those who celebrated uh, Global James Bond Day, um, <laughs> there which is was that today. as well. All right. Uh, stay safe. Stay inside. Wear a damn mask. Register to vote. Go vote. Yeah. Vote. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>